All right. Uh, I, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. This is the first time I'm here in this part of Israel. It's not the first time I'm in Israel. Uh, and uh, my job title at Red Hat, I'm uh, officially, technically, uh, in the company, I'm the crazy guy. And uh, that's why my job title is evangelist. And uh, that job title is a lot of fun here in the region, not only in Israel, but especially in the surrounding countries when you go there. Uh, last time I, uh, I, set, I, I introduced myself as evangelist uh, in Saudi Arabia. It was a lot of fun, let's uh, put it that way. Um, but today I'm not here to talk about uh, Red Hat, the company. Um, if you want to know anything about Red Hat and etc., there's a booth out there. That's where you can talk. Today I'm here to talk about the thing that makes Red Hat possible, the thing that makes open source possible, the thing that makes free software possible, and that is community. And uh, to make sure that you all understand that I'm not talking from a corporate level, I do something that I normally never do in public. I take off my hat. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm technically not allowed to do that. It's in my contract at Red Hat. I started working at Red Hat 11 years ago, and it's in my contract that I have to wear the hat in public. So no, consider this. The, yeah, I'm losing my job right now. I can, uh, if you have something for me, that's fine. Um, the reason for that is extremely simple because uh, one thing that we have learned at Red Hat very early on, when we started the company 23, 24 years ago, in uh, 1993, when um, a few crazy people came together, do you know the first business plan that Red Hat had? After it secured the first round of investment, the first money, uh, Bob Young and Mark Ewing were having a dinner, so Bob Young and Mark Ewing, the founders of Red Hat, were having a dinner with the investors, and uh, the investors were like, well, Bob, What's the business plan? I mean, we just gave you money and we still don't know what you're going to do with it. And he said, well, we're an open source company, so we cannot ask money for the software. But uh, we can sell, I don't know, coffee mugs or something, and you know, t-shirts. And that was the very first business plan. And now it's moved in a slightly different direction. But what we've learned from the very beginning is without community, we don't exist. And without respect for community, we destroy everything behind open source and free software. And that means a lot of things. It means not only that we have to make sure that we create, nurture, and foster communities, but also that we all must learn how this stuff works. Now, thank God Red Hat is not driving that part. A good friend of mine uh, from Belgium, uh, his name is Peter Hintjens, H-I-N-T-J-E-N-S, um, he is almost as crazy as I am. Some would say he's even a little bit more crazy. I met him uh, 15 years ago when in Europe we had a fight, um, a growing fight against software patents. It was a time where uh, the European Patent Office decided we need to have official software patents in Europe. So they made a political movement over the European Commission to introduce software patents uh, to Europe's legal system. Now, we fiercely opposed that was a time before I joined Red Hat. I'm at Red Hat now 11 years, so it was before that. Um, and at that time, I was the core developer of a piece of software. It's written in PHP. I'm sorry for that. I'm not proud of it, but I was young. I needed the experience. Um, and this uh, little piece of software is actually quite big. Um, uh, some of the, the, the elder here in this room might remember it. It's called OS Commerce. It's an uh, e-commerce solution in PHP GPL license. I was one of the core developers of OS Commerce. So if you ever have worked with OS Commerce and you have gone crazy about setting up the text system and the email system in OS Commerce, it's my fault. I wrote that software. <laughs> um, but at that time, we had a community of 100,000 people worldwide. Up until today, OS Commerce is being used by more than 40,000 shops on the internet. It's still working. It's crazy. I've left that project years ago when I joined Red Hat, uh, but it's still going strong. And at that time, I got a call from someone in the US and he said, I am getting sued for patent infringement because I use OS Commerce. And I was like, that's crazy, because I wrote the software. And to other people, not you in the US, you didn't write the software. So how can you get sued for patent infringement? And then I found out how software patents work and how evil they are and how we really must destroy them because they kill everything that that community stands for. Um, so I joined a few people that were fighting against software patents. We were five people. We were five people in Europe um, managing a community 
of round about uh, uh, two to three hundred people uh, that became activists and we managed to kick software patents out of the European legal system. It's a very long and interesting story. It contains illegal stuff. Uh, we manipulated votes in the European Parliament. It's more than 10 years ago now, so I can now freely talk about it. Um, Speak up so you don't hear anything. Even louder, or I'll move a little bit more forward. Oh no, then the camera I will get. It's always complicated, I know. <laughs> so uh, 10 years ago, um, we joined this community, and that's where I met Peter Hintjens. And Peter Hintjens was a very subversive person. He said, we cannot tackle politics by just going there and holding whatever transparency in the air and saying we're against what you're doing. That's not going to work. We have to build a positive alternative. We have to build something that people want to join. If you want to create a movement, you have to give a positive message and not a negative one. If you're against someone, then effectively you're supporting your enemy because without your enemy, you don't exist as a movement, which is wrong. It's a weird, weird way of thinking, but this is what Peter taught me. So Peter created, started experimenting with communities 15 years ago in a very rude and aggressive way. He created throwaway communities. He was thinking about whatever crazy idea. So we had this one idea where we said we need to create um, a subversive movement of small to medium sized businesses that explain to politicians why Europe really needs software patents. And uh, we created that. We created some fake companies. We created some fake CEOs and et cetera. And we sent them to these politicians. And uh, the, we had big transparency. And we had an online website, everything with mailing lists and everything you can imagine. And what they were saying is, we have to leave business to big business. Now, small business is dying. Only big business will survive. So we made very rude statements. And the politicians were completely confused. And ultimately, that made them starting to talk to us anti-patent people because they said, I'm getting so confusing messages from all these kinds. So this is how we started working with that. We developed a system out of that, um, a system that we have fine-tuned over the years up until today. And Peter wrote a book about this. It's called Social Architecture. And Social Architecture is a book. You can download it for free from his website. You can buy it on Amazon for Kindle or print it, whatever you want. It's a very thin book, but it puts together the 30 years of experience that Peter has with communities and building communities. And there are some things in there that I want to talk about today as food for thought if you are working in a community, if you think about creating your own community, about what you're getting into and what it really means. And this is something that we at Red Hat still are working to learn. It's part of my job to convince my own company uh, that we do some things completely wrong and we need to change our behavior. So with all that said, let's go deeper into it. Why do you create communities and especially open source communities? Uh, the main reason is because you want to solve a problem. That's the classical approach. That's what everybody is saying. The problem is the moment you have solved a problem, you start all over again. One of the things that we have seen over the past 20, 30 years of open source and free software is that software is absolutely worthless. The code is totally worthless. And not only from a monetary perspective, even if you're extremely proud of your hacks, like I was 20 years ago, when I created the hack in OS Commerce to get the global tax system in three database tables, and I was so proud of that stuff. It has been replaced in OS Commerce six months later because the code was refactored, and somebody else came up with something even more cool. So code is relatively worthless. People are far more important. So if you build a community, or if you're a member of a community, and if you're in open source, you know this thing. Let's create a fantasy community of a quite successful project that does something like, I don't know, uh, container monitoring. I have to say a buzzword once a day. That's part of my contract. Uh, so contain, you create a wonderful container monitoring solution. And it's based on Docker. And now somebody says, well, this is cool, but we are using Rocket, uh, so uh, an alternative to, to Docker. And uh, we want to uh, also use this monitoring system. So somebody writes a little patch that makes sure that this monitoring system also works with Rocket. And he goes to the upstream community of this monitoring system and says, here is my patch. Let's imagine they're on GitHub, because everybody is on GitHub nowadays. We like monoculture in open source. Uh, before that we had SourceForge, now we have GitHub, and in two years we will have something else, I know it. Um, so you write a pull request, 
and then what happens? Nothing. Because most open source projects work in a way that's based on merit, where a small group of developers has the commit rights, and they decide what goes into the project and what doesn't go into the project. So what typically happens is it sits there for a while, because it's a pull request by somebody who is not a member of the community. He comes from the outside world. He solves a problem that the community hasn't identified or documented. They didn't think about supporting Rocket. They're happy with their Docker support. So it sits there. Up until somebody decides to look at it from the core developer team. And they look at it and they're like, well, you know, we don't really need this shit. And by the way, he again confused tabs and spaces, so I'm not going to merge this. So, after a few weeks, your contributor starts asking, so what's wrong with my patch? Did I do something wrong? Do I need to fix something? Yeah, you confuse tabs and spaces. Go away. <laughs> and then, you know, you rewrite it. You, you, you replace the tabs and the spaces. And you say, okay, now I replace the tabs and the spaces. Is it now okay? And then somebody says, well, actually, we haven't even thought about supporting a, a rocket. We don't, we don't really care about it. We care about Docker, so we actually don't need your code. Net result, this contributor who invested his own time, who created something that might be of use to other people too, feels refused. He feels negatively treated. So Peter has decided to turn it upside down. Um, the upside down method is you merge everything that comes in immediately. No questions asked. You stop having discussions about, do we need this feature? Is it coded in the right way? Uh, do the tabs and spaces fit? Are the coding guidelines fulfilled? You completely stop that. You, Im you merge immediately. Even if it breaks your complete project, that's fine. Why is it fine? Because number one, the new contributor that comes in feels immediately appreciated. His patch is immediately accepted. Second, the core developers and the people who know the code now can work on fixing the issues and sending feedback. OK, we had to change this. We had to change that because we have this and this rule and this and that thing. So the developer, the contributor, gets immediate feedback from senior people. So he feels part of the community. And then after one or two days, the things typically tend up to get fixed. Now, if the patch is totally unreal and bad, then somebody can revert it, uh, pull it out of the system, but then you have a note in Git that this was done. The name of the guy who tried to give you bad code is in your Git commit history. He will never come back again, which is a good thing. So <laughs> by using these tools in a slightly different way, you create an inclusive community, a community where people want to be. This does not work with a classical community setup, so you also have to rethink how you want to run and build your community. So one of the things that Peter says, there are no bugs. Everything that comes in is a problem, and a problem needs a solution. So before you write code, before you submit a patch with a new feature, you have to describe the problem that you're solving. And when you, the problem is described, it automatically becomes part of the feature list, it becomes part of the roadmap, it becomes part of everything. But start thinking in problems. What problem am I going to solve? Because a good problem description can be discussed in the community, on mailing lists, and etc., in a far more productive way. Because you typically come with code already. Code is in that sense bigger than people, but over time, people are bigger than code. And that's what you really want. You want to create an inclusive community where people come and go. We call that the drive-by uh, contributors. A lot of people want to contribute a very small patch. They see something wrong. They see something written wrong, a spelling uh, error or parameter written wrong. And they just want to drive by, give you that one single patch, and then they're gone. They are helpful to your community. Don't push them away. Don't let their contributions sit around for ages, for weeks and months. Just immediately merge it. And have a group of people that have the commit rights and etc. make sure that they check how this stuff works. Peter goes even further. Peter says, um, a maintainer of a project should not have code commit rights. He is allowed to merge and do everything, but he's not allowed to write code. Because when you mix up code writing and code merging, you create kingdoms. You create somebody who controls a part of your pro uh, project. And he will subconsciously or consciously try to move it in his direction. If you give him this power, you have discussions. And everybody here who has developed open source projects 
knows the flame wars that come from that kind of stuff, knows the long discussions you have on mailing lists where people are focusing on writing mails telling other people how stupid they are and how smart they are themselves and they use examples typically, let's run down the list of typical examples used in flame wars in open source discussion. What's the first one? Analogy to cars. Always starts with a car. Then it ends up with the bike shedding. Then it comes with paint and then blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, no code gets written. What use are discussions when you, they don't lead to code? So you have to find mechanisms that reduce these discussions completely, theoretically. Practically, it will never work. You will always have discussions. So in a good open source project, you don't have a roadmap. The roadmap is written by a long list of problem descriptions that come with solutions. You create an inclusive community where people are always welcome to come and you know they will always leave. That's also a very natural thing. People, first of all, the drive-by contributors, they don't stay for long. They just have this one single issue that they want to get fixed and then they're gone. The second group are people that do it in their spare time. And spare time people tend to change their spare time activities. It's perfectly normal for someone to be totally motivated for a few months, maybe a year or two years, and then he drops out or she drops out. One of the reasons they drop out, and that's a serious issue that many people in open source underestimate, one of the reasons people drop out of communities where they have been very active is first of all when there are too many flame wars and they feel like they cannot argue on that level because they, they're better at writing code. And the second thing, and that's far more relevant and dangerous, and I've seen it happening over and over again, is people getting burned out. Now let's not underestimate the fact that if you spend your spare time or your job time for years and years in a project the way I did with OS Commerce, I managed that for six years roundabout. I also managed the community of 100,000 people for six years as a spare time activity next to my job, which was back-end development for a hosting company. So you can imagine how my wife looked at me when I was sitting there till 2 o'clock in the morning printing out all these different text systems of all over the world trying to deduce it to a good solution. It ruins your life if you go too deep. So as a good project manager, you need to recognize this and you need to take people out of the fire and say, okay, take a step back, do something different, work on the documentation or do something completely different because your job as a project manager is to protect your people so that your community can grow. Now, all of this sounds very theoretical, but if you read his book, again, it is for free. You can download it for free. Uh, there's also a longer version uh, called Culture and Empire, which goes deeper into the negative uh, uh, effects of trolls and all that kind of stuff, which is really fun to read, how you treat trolls and psychopaths in your community, because they will inadvertently pop up. There is no way. Trolls love open source because that's where they can engage people in flame wars and show them how cool they are without ever writing code. How cool is that? You know, this is for a troll, this is paradise. Um, so we at Red Hat have looked at all of this for the past 20 years also in our way because we are a commercial entity. We are a company. We have to make money. And we learned effectively the same lessons. A community that cares for itself that cares for solving problems in a good way is a community that will survive for a long time. A community that survives for a long time is a good fundament for a product or a service you want to put into the market. A community that is focused on a very small problem and when it solved, falls apart or moves in different direction is not a good fundament for a long-term solution. And long-term solutions tend to be very, very unsexy. They are not cool. They are not stuff that you can build a venture capital startup on. They are core solutions that you need in the IT stack. Look at a few very successful projects that have managed to survive for more than 20, 25 years. Stuff like uh, the GCC project, the GNU compiler collection, the glibc, um, uh, bind, uh, or effectively all IC software. Uh, if you look at all of this stuff, Perl, Perl is always my most famous example. Who here still programs in Perl? They exist. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Perl 6 is out right now. And, and you know, who, who works with Python? Thank you. I'm Dutch, so that's a good thing. Um, Python was created by a Dutch guy, so, you know, Guido van Rossum, so that's, I'm really proud of that. Uh, but look at how these communities work. Go, when you go to PyCon, there was a PyCon here in Israel recently. Uh, when you go to these conferences, you see the amount of mutual respect that carries a long-term community. Go to a startup conference, 
and you see a lot of people bitching and bickering at each other because they are better or whatever in whatever way. These kind of things separate good and bad communities. Now, what we have to care about at Red Hat is when we put something in our products, we are going to support it for typically 10 years. So we have to find communities that last for 10 years or where at least we can take over should they fall apart because then the cost is on us. We have found some methods and weapons to separate the short-lived from the long-lived communities and we share all of that on our website called uh, theopensourceway.org which uh, we put together a few years ago. And just like Peter did with his book on how to create communities, we did the same from our perspective from a corporate side. So if you want to see the other side, go there. Now, Peter, in, 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 uh, uh, let's, let's put a little bit of history behind that. Who here is, has ever heard of uh, AMQP, the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol, or 0MQ? Who has heard of 0MQ? Okay, did you know that AMQP and 0MQ were written by the same guy? And that's Peter. That's Peter Hintjens from Belgium. He went to, he went to, Yes, it's a longer story, but the original idea and architecture uh, from AMQP was created at the Chase Manhattan Bank where Peter was a consultant and told them this is how we do it. Then AMQP moved into a death by committee direction where the whole industry it was the positive story. The whole industry is now doing AMQP and AMQP was changed in a way where Peter didn't feel comfortable anymore. So he started a new community and they created Zero MQ where he said we're doing better. Uh, the result of all of that is that Peter has in 0MQ created, because this is his big lesson, the license part is solved. We know about licenses, open source licenses, that's solved. If you want to create a good open source community, you have to use a license that uses reciprocity. So BSD is not ideal for a long-lived community in our opinion. I know some people think completely different about it. I'm ready to take that flame more outside over a cigarette. Um, so my, still my preferred license for a lot of reasons is a GPL. Um, and that's not because I'm hardcore free software, it's simply because I come from this patent history. And the GPL was one of the first licenses to actually care about patents in, in software licensing. So that's why I like it. Um, more acceptable to the industry nowadays typically is the MPL, MPL2, or the Apache license. Uh, one of these, this is what you take. So with a license that has reciprocity, you have solved the problem of getting the code back and keeping it together and all that stuff. But Peter says, we are missing something else. We are missing a code for the community. Now, don't tell me code of conduct. I'm not a fan of code of conduct. I want to see exactly the opposite. I want to see a code of misconduct. I want to make sure that we can identify bad people in our community and kick them out immediately. I don't want bad apples in my, uh, in, in my group, seriously. So, um, but we need to have a contract for collaboration. And that's what the Zero MQ project has. And the Zero MQ project uh, called this uh, the C4 uh, contract, the contract for collaboration, which spells out the rules that I described more fluffy here in real detail. So you can say, you can open a project on GitHub and you can say, I'm using the GPL version three or the ASL uh, 2.0, whatever. Um, and I'm also uh, using the rules of the C4 collaboration project. It's a short text, it's not much, but the moment you have that, the collaboration is sorted and solved. You don't have to ask, part of C4 is using a license that, that promotes reciprocity so that you have compatibility. So you never have to use a contrib uh, contributory license agreement. You know these open source projects? where you look up them and you say, oh, wow, I want to participate. And then they say, yes, you have to sign this paper first. And your employer has to sign it too. And you give all of your children and your house and et cetera to us. And then you are maybe allowed to patch that little spelling error in our documentation. It's ridiculous. So how do you create a system where you don't even need a CLA? This is also one thing that we thought about at Red Hat. And uh, in Fedora, I can now safely say in Fedora, we are now uh, three years uh, free of CLAs. Um, in Red Hat, we are almost free of CLAs. We have a small part in middleware uh, b because that's Java, and Java has an old legacy of Sun and Oracle and etc. So there is a little thing. But most of the things we can now do without you as a developer having to sign such papers. Because again, the only thing a community should care about is to be welcoming and inviting to everyone. You want more contributors in your community. 
You don't want to have an elite group of three people who does everything because they will burn out or they will leave or they will get in such flame wars that the whole project falls apart. I've experienced this. I've, I was in a project, I'm not going to name it because it's still embarrassing. Um, and I did a little bit of work for them and uh, we were ready to ship the new version. And the project manager, uh, smart young man, um, and after years and years of being single, he finally found a girlfriend. And he was so proud of not being single that he decided the next version of this project, we're going to name it after his girlfriend. And we said, you don't know what you're into. We had version 2.3. The only thing we are going to do is to go to 2.4. You can give it an additional title with the name of your girlfriend if you want to. I don't care. But we're not going to change the versioning system from a number-based system to a name-based system just because you now have a girlfriend. What happened is the project got forked. <laughs> it really got... <laughs> I'm not kidding. It got forked over the versioning scheme, not over the code. Now this is stuff you do not want to have in a community. And the only way to avoid it is to have a process and a rule. When you have unwritten processes, unwritten rules, when you have agreements with the core developers and they're not written down, you already have created uh, everything that's needed for chaos. Because somebody will interpret the rules in this way and that way and somebody will make up new rules on the fly to save their position in the project. I've seen it all happening. I'm in open source. I started developing open source in 1993 with the Linux kernel. Um, I was not very good. I, I, I adapted a driver for my VGA card. At that time, the patch was never accepted. So that's where my career went in the other direction. That's when I learned PHP, um, which was the biggest mistake in my life. Never learned PHP. But we now have solid knowledge over 20, 25 years on how to create communities and how to work with them. We have documentation written about it. We have experience about it. But we also have, and this is where it gets a little bit murky and complicated, we also have people like me standing here in front of a community and only talking without giving you the possibility for feedback, which is wrong. We have books written, which is the most, I, I love this one. Um, there is a book about community. I'm not going to name the name because then you know who I'm talking about. Uh, you will find out anyway. Um, a, a book written by someone on his own. And I, I called him and I said, why are you doing this? Why are you publishing a book with only your name claiming that you know how to create communities? Because communities are created by a lot of people and not by a single one. And I've seen your book and I've seen you've been copy pasting a lot of stuff from articles from other people and you don't reference them. That's the wrong way to do it. I will never join your community. That's a good thing because I don't want to join his community. But ultimately, my core message to all of you is if you are in open source and in free software, we need to have a solid fundament to create communities and rules for them because what we should not forget, I know this conference here exists for a long time. 16 years, was that correct? 15. 15 years. In 15 years, everything has changed. In 15 years, Red Hat grew from a very small company to a two billion revenue company. And I can tell you one thing that you need to understand and really get into your mind very, very deeply. Open source and free software already rules the world. The question of will it happen is already solved. I'm very deep into very big customers. Not a single big customer out there creates a new IT stack or their current IT stack without using open source. Many, many companies have hired open source developers. Many, many open source developers have switched their open source work from spare time activity to their full paid job. And they don't all work at Red Hat. A lot of companies that build their stuff using open source employ these people because then they get solutions faster. The time that open source and free software was an idealistic movement is gone. It's now running this world. We need to understand that we are running this world. We open source developers, we project managers, we open source people. We have a very big responsibility for what we're doing. And we need to take that serious. Um, I've seen with my customers, one of the very typical questions I get, I talk to a customer who has just invested, uh, say, and I'm not kidding, these numbers are real, uh, 10 billion euro 
in a new infrastructure. This is a telco customer. They plan to run uh, to invest 10 billion euro over the next four years to modernize their mobile network and etc. It's a lot of money. And they told me that with open source, which is now the default thing to use in telco, they can save, they have saved around about 50%. The original planning they made six years ago was 40 billion euro. They said, this is what we need. Now we can do it with 20 billion because we have commodity hardware, we have open source solutions on every part of the layer, and we can scale out uh, indefinitely. Without open source companies like Google and Twitter simply wouldn't exist. So we have a huge responsibility with every single open source project we manage. It's sometimes just a hobby, I get it. It's sometimes just a very weird thing. A lot of the JavaScript libraries, I sometimes really ask, do they have to exist? But OK, they exist. Um, when I see that a blog page nowadays pulls in for two kilobytes of content, 900 kilobytes of JavaScript libraries and other stuff, I'm not sure if we're doing the right thing. Um, but what I do know is there are a lot of motivated people behind all of these projects working very hard on delivering the next big thing that they think is going to change the world. But don't forget, we already did that. This world is running on open source and free software. You cannot spend a day in your modern life without using open source and free software. Even Microsoft has recognized that. Microsoft. You know, I've been fighting Microsoft for so long <laughs> that I don't even know how to be friendly to them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and they become Red Hat's partner. And now Azure and Red Hat and everything, and we're big friends, kumbaya, my lord, and all of that <laughs> stuff. And I'm sitting there, you know, is, uh, am I waking up? But then I read the news and I see Donald Trump and I know, no, the world is real. Um, but what we see from Microsoft is how Microsoft under Satya Nadella really has turned around. How they are really interested in open source methods, how they really care about it. One of the things we refused to do with uh, Microsoft was a patent deal. They wanted us to have a patent deal because they say we have patents and we're going to sue the hell out of anybody who uses Linux. And we said we don't, we don't buy that. It's on our page. On every Red Hat page at the bottom is the Red Hat patent promise where we say software patents are wrong. They need to go away, but they exist. So we have to work within the system and fight it from within the system. Um, so that was the big discussion. But we now see at conferences Microsoft people coming in and I'm actually bodyguarding them. Can you imagine that? I was at a conference and there were three .NET developers from Microsoft and they were your typical open source kind of developers, you know, guys who were, let's say, not spending each day in the gym. And they were sitting there in front of an, of an audience full of hardcore open source people and they were actually booed at because they said, you know, we don't want Microsoft people here. Stop that shit. You know, this is not how open source works. This is not how free software works listen at least to them. They do a lot of things wrong. Don't get me wrong. Microsoft still does a lot of things wrong. They do a lot of weird things with patents and, and intellectual property rights that I never ever can support. But I can tell you one thing. When somebody comes to me and reaches his hand, I'll take it and I'll take him with me and then we'll move along and see how far we can go together. So don't be exclusive. Be inclusive. Accept all the stuff. Read Peter Hintian's book. Thank you for listening. And if you have more questions, I'm quite sure you will find me because I'm the only one with this one. Thank you.